John was enjoying a welcome mid-morning break when he was the victim of a vicious street crime. It cost him several thousand pounds, but it wasn't until the next day he realized the enormity of it. All he can recall was responding to a text from what he thought was his bank, urgently asking him to verify his security details. Moments later, he'd been robbed in broad daylight. You can't see cybercrime, but there are ways to avoid it. At Barclays, we'll never ask you to verify your security details by text. of Mike Graham on Talk Radio. Now it is time to say, without further ado, a very good morning to Mr. Peter Hitchens. Peter, how are you? Good morning. Um, as I suspected, uh, you will say, I was right all along, you should never have trusted them, now look what they're doing. And I can't disagree with any of that, really. <laughs> well, I won't bother to say it in that case. I mean, <laughs> what's been amusing over the past uh, couple of weeks has been the number of people saying, oh... Actually, yes, the Tories aren't any good. They are useless. And uh, even occasionally people saying Hitchens was right. Uh, my favourite... Uh, this must, uh, like this must irk you somewhat, though, Peter, because we know how contrary you like to be. The idea that people well, say you must no, have been right it must well, be very upsetting for you. Uh, one of my chief joys in life is saying, I told you so. It, it, it has to be, because what else can I, what else can I get pleasure out of? But, and I did. But it was a wonderful headline in the Daily Telegraph not long ago, saying... A conservative party, not um, not very conservative. Uh, I thought no, it was the biggest biggest news. And the Telegraph will soon be catching up with the fact that Harold Goldwinson lost the Battle of Hastings. Yes, quite. Now, would you say that you would agree with me that they have backed off this vaccine passport uh, idea purely and simply because they've worked out that people not only don't want it, but don't really understand it and don't know how to make it work? Well, I think that's probably it. They, 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 they've zigzagged unceasingly over this, it seems to me. I can't remember how many times they've changed their position on it. So don't rely on them necessarily sticking to this position. But mm. I think the difficulty with it has always been uh, that it will be very, very hard to implement if they try, try to bring it in. And the failure to implement it will weaken them in a way, of course, that, that failed law enforcement does. I think that may have a lot to do with it. Uh, I, I, I have a suspicion that a, an awful lot of people don't have very adequate records, for mm. instance, of their, of their vaccines. And also the, the number of the people who would be most affected by a vaccine passport scheme at, say, nightclubs are among those who have yet to be vaccinated. So I, I, I suspect it's practicality rather than public opinion, but who can tell with this lot? Well, it is difficult, isn't it? And as you say, they do go backwards and forwards. I mean, many of the things that they have brought in, they said they weren't going to. And many of the things they said they were going to bring in, they haven't brought in. So it's sort of uh, six of one, half dozen of the other, isn't it? Or they change their mind later. Yeah. Uh, because we're now, we're now entering the, the, the early autumn period when numbers of people in hospital will inevitably, alas, rise. And this could be the trigger for all kinds of things which the, the, the government is technically ruling out or trying to avoid. And I, I really wouldn't like to predict the course of events over the next ooh, two months uh, or how serious it might get. But I certainly wouldn't rely on this government to, to, to stay away from the, 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 the heavy authoritarian measures which it's used in the past. If, it's, if, it's, if, if, they, if, if they feel it will, suit, it will suit them to do this politically, then they will do that. Mm. Well, this is interesting, isn't it? Because I was talking to my 17-year-old at the weekend who a few weeks ago when he was offered the vaccine wanted to take it on the grounds that he wouldn't be able to do anything if he didn't. And I said, well, let's just wait and see, shall we? And sure enough, it turns out that he's not going to be stopped from going into a nightclub or a, a bar uh, next year because he doesn't have a vaccination. So, you know, it was maybe just for that purpose in the first place. Yeah, but you couldn't have known that then, could you? And it's not, you can't just turn up and have the vaccination and then and then it's over. If you, to be vaccinated to get a certificate, you'd have to have it twice yeah. over a quite long period of time. So you could be left high and dry, couldn't you, with yeah. your life severely curtailed if the government had taken a different view. And you can quite understand why people might say, well, let's be prepared for that. Uh, and I, and I think a lot of people probably have. Yes, yes but, but I, but I, I mean, I've had, I've had... Of, of, of universities themselves, which are behaving quite disgracefully at the moment in, in, in insisting on distance learning rather than actual physical contact for, for, for a lot of lectures, and they're simply not giving value for money. And I, I suspect a lot of people of student age have, have thought, well, maybe if I get if, if I get vaccinated, then I'll be able to insist. 
on getting a proper university course. But I don't think they, mm. I don't think even if they do that these the universities, which seem to me to be uh, rapacious businesses rather than educational institutions now, are going to pay much attention to it. No, I don't think they are. I mean, they're, they're not too interested in socially distancing from China, according to the front page of the Times today. But that's, well, it, it's another it's, story. It's hardly surprising, that really, is it? Extraordinary how how deep China has got into our university system. Yes, um, and, and and deeper all the time, and in fact, deeper into this country in general. It's uh, and what do you, I mean, given that you have many many times warned of things that will come back to bite us. I mean, what is the long term strategy for China in doing that? Do you think? Well, the, China is, is becoming a, a a great world power, and it is unhesitating in defending its own interests and in standing up for itself. And I I, I always say of countries which do this, I don't criticise them for, for looking after their own interests because that's what countries should mm. do. I, I criticise our own government for not being as tough. I just I often admire the French for being completely ruthless in pursuing what they want. Uh, we don't, and I think we should, and the Chinese should recognise when they, they try and influence events in this country and buy their way into power and interests in this country that, that we are going to resist it. Uh, but we show no signs of doing so. That's a great willingness, particularly in bodies like universities, to to, to count out yeah. uh, China. And the, the, the biggest symbol of this, which is visible and audible all the time in this country, is the pathetic uh, use of the word Beijing uh, to describe the capital of China uh, instead of Peking, mm. uh, which was actually forced on us uh, by, or, by, or forced on, on British media by threats from the Chinese foreign ministry. One of them recorded to the Times newspaper that if they didn't start saying Beijing instead of Peking, uh, the, the the Chinese authorities would withdraw cooperation from their correspondent in that yeah. country. Ridiculous! Imagine the the the, 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 the us calling in the, the correspondents of French newspapers and saying if you don't start calling London London instead of Londres, we're going to stop cooperating with you. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of absurd nonsense. And when we gave into that, they obviously knew that we that they could push us around anywhere. And so they have. It would be a wonderful symbolic moment if we just started calling it Peking again. Well, I think it, so, yeah. It wouldn't, I mean, wouldn't confuse anybody. It's still called Peking Duck. And the biggest and most prestigious university in Peking is called the University of Peking. Hmm. And the code for Peking Airport is still P-E-K. And all the French and German and Russian newspapers still call it Peking. Right. So why do we do this kowtow? Yeah. Because, because we, we instinctively grovel. And when they see someone groveling, they say, OK, make them grovel more. Well, precisely. And isn't it surprising that people don't see that coming? You know, a little bit like uh, when I was talking last week about Extinction Rebellion, um, who, having given um, instructions to the government to do various things, having now got the government to do them, are now saying it's not enough. Uh, Greta Thunberg saying, you know, uh, actually, the government in Britain is engaged in uh, clever accounting, carbon accounting, uh, because once you start to give extremists any kind of sucker, uh, they want more. It's not enough. Look, it's in, any, in any battle, if you demonstrate will and the other person gives way, then, then you're winning, aren't you? I, 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 don't, I don't like to use the term extremist because it's generally used uh, as a way of dismissing the opinions which just don't have to be fashionable at the moment. Uh, well, I call the extinction what's rebellion wrong, what's people. Wrong, what's well, I call what's extinction wrong. rebellion extremists because of the way well, they behave. You can call them that if you like, but it, I, I'd rather say that the, the problem with extinction rebellion is that they they're so dogmatic, and the, there is this continuing problem with uh, with the destruction of coal fired power in this country, uh, which is only being done for dogmatic reasons. Even if you accept, and I decline to argue about the issue of man made global warming anymore. Because everyone gets hysterical so quickly. But even if you accept that they, these arguments are correct, the destruction of, of coal-fired power in this country is meaningless because the, the Chinese and the Indians are building so many coal-fired power stations that they've cancelled out whatever may have been gained uh, in, 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 in reducing atmospheric pollution dozens of times over. Uh, and it, was, it didn't, d didn't do any good. It's, it's a purely symbolic, dogmatic thing, and yet they insist upon it. And this it suggests to me that we're being ruled by people who are, who are more, actually more religious than political. Yes. Well, interestingly, um, you touched on the whole um, anniversary of September the 11th over the weekend, because it was, of course, the 20th anniversary. An awful lot of things were said and written and, and pronounced upon. Um, I quite, would, quite liked your take on the whole terror business, which is really that, you know, there's not an awful lot that we've done to stop it. Um, it could happen again at any time, really. Um, and what are we to do, really? Well, terrorism, terrorism, you can never say it won't happen again. Everybody says it won't happen again. The nature of terrorism is it's often very inventive, uh, surprise attack, as 
as was done against New York City 20 years ago. And now, I have to say, I think that particular form of attack would be difficult. The very simple measure of never opening uh, the doors of the flight deck while a, while a plane is in flight to anybody uh, and, the, and the careful screening of people attending flying schools pretty much eliminates that from happening again. Mm. But the real problem with terror is that is that, that that is exactly what it is. It frightens governments and nations and cultures and societies into into changing themselves for the worse. And we, we changed immeasurably for the worse after September the 11th. Mm. We became more, uh, more willing to suppress our own liberty, uh, to undergo all kinds of humiliating checks all the time. We made international travel a nightmare. And in doing so, we, we gave them a tremendous victory. Uh, the, in, in many ways, the best response to it is not to do anything that they want us to do, not to, not to live in fear of them, to try to prevent them, obviously, with, uh, as far as you possibly can, but ultimately not to, not to let these, these, uh, these attacks, which are demonstration attacks. I mean, look, it was horrible, the number of people who died on, in, in, in New York City that day, and, and the, the destruction was, was appalling. But in terms of, it, it, compared with a, a major war, such as the Second World War, even the Korean War, uh, the numbers of people killed were not enormous. The threats to the American economy and the stability of society were uh, were nothing like the threats, for instance, to this country and its stability in the Second World War. Uh, so we didn't need to change our behaviour to the extent that we did, and yet we have. Yes, uh, I but we, I suppose we, we're not we're not we're not consistent about terror. Uh, when they proclaimed the war on terror, they excluded the Irish Republican Army mm-hmm. provisional wing. Uh, a body with which both the United States and British governments have had uh, have had dealings through their front organisation Sinn Féin. So, uh, what what is this? What are we? What, what point are we really making by imprisoning ourselves in all these restrictions uh, on on normal life and abandoning a lot yeah. of our liberties, setting up secret prisons and black sites and, uh, and, and resorting to torture? Why are we doing this? Instead of saying these people should not be allowed to alter our way of life, that's precisely what they shouldn't be allowed yeah. to. Do. I mean, I think that's right, generally speaking. But I must admit, and you will know this as well from your travels in the States. I mean, there was a time when traveling around on planes in America was a bit like getting a bus down West End Lane. I mean, there was hardly there was no security. I mean, I remember going in and out of airports for a cigarette and going through security one way, going back out the other way. And I could have been doing anything. And I mean, it probably needs to be better than that. Well, sure. But as as I say, the the measures which you can take these days are particularly the, the, the closing flight deck doors, pretty much obviate most of the dangers. I, 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 it's not, it really, it, we really have overreacted to this. And the other thing which we did, say the, the introduction of lengthy periods of detention without trial, mm. uh, the, the, the suspension in many ways of habeas corpus and Magna Carta, uh, were huge changes in our society done at the behest uh, of, of this extraordinary group of people. The other thing which I, I keep pointing to, and I, I hugely recommend again and again and again a fantastic book on September the 11th called The Eleventh Day by Summers and Swan, uh, which actually describes what happened and, uh, and makes the point, which I seriously make, that people should pay more attention to the fact uh, that most of the hijackers came from Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And they were certainly bankrolled, it would appear, from Saudi Arabian coffers, whether or not it was. Well, it's very, difficult. it's very difficult to go any further than that. And I, I, I'm not really ready to do so because the, one needs facts. I simply point out that there, there is, if you read the book, you'll get this very strong impression that this is an aspect of the, of the event which is, is not very much pursued, uh, either in political or security terms, and I think should be taken more seriously. Yes, in the very same way that Bob Woodward's book, at Bush at War, uh, points out in the very first chapter, that the decision was made to invade Iraq on the basis of 9-11, even knowing that it was nothing to do with Iraq. Well, that's so disgraceful, and it remains one of the great disgraces of modern times, the, the war on Iraq, and what's more, the failure of intelligence informed opinion to, uh, at high levels to oppose it. And it's perfectly true that large numbers of people of the traditional left went out on the streets to oppose the Iraq war, and they were quite right to do so. Uh, but other people who should also have opposed it in positions of responsibility, educated uh, people in, in all the major political parties, the civil service and the media, who supported this nonsense, uh, who could have seen with a moment's attention and work that it was it was not a, that, that Iraq was not the origin of September the 11th, uh, still have a huge burden of guilt on them for the catastrophe which they mm. visited on. So catastrophe which it has so many effects, not turning the Middle East into a cauldron and also beginning this gigantic wave of, of migration 
uh, out of the out of the Middle East in, in, and towards Europe, uh, which is still having such an immense effect on our societies. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. Speaking of which, we will return to that theme because coming up, uh, Peter, if you stay with us for a moment, um, we're just going to stop briefly to talk coming up about why uh, he wishes he was still living in 1962 because life was a lot different then. This is Talk Radio. Online on Talk Radio. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk Radio. We're talking to Peter Hitchens from the Mail on Sunday. Peter wrote a piece at the weekend about um, the old days, uh, for want of a better phrase, I suppose, 1962 to be precise. It was in uh, response to something that had been written before. Peter, tell us about uh, about that. What happens is David Kynaston, a historian, has written a book called On the Cusp about 1962, describing really the last year before the modern world took over Britain. Uh, and it's, it is a fascinating little book. Uh, and our book reviewer, Craig Brown, had uh, written a, a piece about this in which he had c c cast doubt on the idea that, uh, that uh, there'd been any such thing as the good old days and so on and so forth. And people uh, talking about golden ages should understand how much worse life was. And I uh, responded to this by saying, well, actually, if forced to choose between living in 1962 and 2021, having lived in both of them, I would choose 1962. Uh, this is not some golden age rubbish. I recognise many things wrong with 1962, from the incessant smoking and the chillblains and the <laughs> awful food and the uh, and all kinds of other dreadful things, not to mention the, the, the terrible teeth and so forth. But I also understand that the, the world has, has not necessarily been a total improvement in the, in the, the, the 60 years between then and now. Mm. And I pointed out one fascinating thing. People often say, oh, it's the, the, the Ladybird book version of the of the world was yeah. completely cleaned up and ridiculous. And in fact, I quoted from an obituary of the man who, who, who did the drawings for the Lady Bird books of, of that period. And this was in The Guardian, a left-wing newspaper, and it, it pointed out that the artist had actually been working from photographs he'd taken uh, of uh, new council estates mm. in the West Midlands, where he had, which was known to him. And he was giving a completely true account of a, of a, of a world where respectable working-class people lived uh, lives of considerable calm and and uh, and, and prosperity uh, and cleanliness and order, which a lot of people would find enviable today. Yeah. And one of the things that I often say about now and then is that one of the greatest disasters of modern times, still praised very foolishly, I think, by many conservatives, the, uh, the the sale of council houses and the breakup of the council estates, mm -hmm. which were uh, which were very settled and often very happy communities, and which ceased to exist, and which we could badly do with, especially given that we now have a housing benefit system that costs more than the Royal Air Force uh, to maintain and does no good at all. But not just that. I mean, there were the, the, the state schools were immeasurably better. The levels of law and order were better. And there's one fascinating contrast here. Uh, it's absolutely true that the hospitals we have today are far more advanced and the, and the doctors far better trained than they were in 1962. And it's a good thing they are because of the huge numbers of people who come into those hospitals with terrible knife wounds, who, given the medical standards of 1962, would die, uh, giving us, therefore, a huge homicide rate comparable with that in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's only because we save so many people from serious knife trauma that they, that, that they live at all. Now, that's an interesting thing, is that you've got a material advance. Uh, the hospitals are better, the skills are better, uh, but the, the actual society in which they exist is, has declined into one which is far more violent and contains far more danger than before. If you're swapping, uh, if you're trying to work out which of those is more valuable, which is, in fact, more important, the society where people are more civilised and better behaved or where the technology is better and there are more mobile yes. phones. And the what... other thing, 62, which is crucial, is that in 62 we hadn't taken some of the really stupid decisions we took, uh, the, the abolition of the grammar schools and the, the, the destruction of the railways, which are now pretty much irreversible. And the future was therefore still open to being much better than it it could possibly be now. Yes. And one of the things you also mentioned in passing uh, was the drug problem, because drugs now are far more widespread, I suppose, than they far were more then. Um, and, and that is possibly one of the most important factors, you would say. Well, this is my response. I mean, people say, I'd say the smoking was, was terrible, but actually a startling number of people still do smoke tobacco in, this, in, in our society, and it's, it's still promoted by product placement in, in films and on television, amazingly well advertising is banned. But it's been joined by another poison, uh, de facto legalised, particularly marijuana, whose effects remain unmeasured, but which the use of which is correlated so strongly 
uh, both with mental illness and with violent behaviour, that I, I'm amazed that we, we put up with this and concentrate so much effort on, on trying to stamp out ordinary cigarettes. I mean, I'm absolutely in favour of continuing to, to, to make tobacco smoking a, a thing of the past. But why, if we're rightly concerned about that, we, we actually, there are so many people in our society who actually want to, to re, re, relax the restrictions on marijuana. I simply don't know. So there's another comparison where I don't think 1962 comes off so badly. No, quite. And I suppose other people might say, and we haven't got a lot of time for this one, I'm afraid, but so if you'd give me a reasonably succinct answer, some people might say immigration has changed dramatically over the past 60 years as well. Well, maybe it has, but I think immigration is, is, is always, it's the way it's managed that's important. If you have a society which seeks to integrate those who come, then immigration will work. If you don't, then it won't. Uh, but I will say one other thing, which I think is absolutely unquestionable, and anybody who was a, who was a child at the time in the early 60s will say the same thing. We were so much freer. We could go where we liked. We weren't constantly supervised, forced to sit at home, staring at screens. We could just go out. That's gone completely. And it, 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 in judging the value of the of society of today against the society of 1962, it's one of the crucial things in yeah. which life has got a lot worse. Yeah, there were a lot fewer signs in those days as well, weren't there? Yeah. Now, everywhere you go, there's a sign telling you what to do. Peter, Don't do that. Very great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Peter Hitchens, Mail on Sunday, columnist as ever, uh, talking about a wide variety of things, some of which he wrote about uh, this weekend. Fascinating stuff. Um, the world has changed, and sometimes you would say for the better, sometimes you might say uh, for the worse. We'll take your calls on that as well, 0344 499 1000. Coming up, we're going to talk about the phenomenon uh, that is...